Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Dennis Van Pervelde from the Global CCS Institute. I'll be the MC for today's webinar. The topic of this webinar is CCS learning from the LNG sector. This is based on a report that Worley Parsons recently completed for the Institute. Steve Hensel and Graham Cox from Worley Parsons will present the webinar and I will introduce them shortly. This webinar is part of our broader program of webinars of CCS. This slide shows the planned webinars for 2013-14 and around half of these have now been completed. The webinars have been recorded and are accessible from our website. Today's webinar will also be recorded and will be made, made available on our website in the near future. We welcome questions asked throughout the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it in into the GoToWebinar program. I'll moderate these questions and post them to William Parsons at the end of the presentation. But now I would like to introduce Steve Hensel, a chemical engineer and has also completed a diploma of business management. He is currently a principal process specialist at William Parsons. He has over 30 years experience in oil and gas facilities development worldwide and he has been actively involved in the advent of the new coal seam gas to LNG project in Queensland. Today Steve will um, co-present with Graham um, and he will present results from a report that Wally Parson recently completed. Um, Steve will focus on the work, the LNG sector, its value chain and its global status. Graham Cox is a chemical engineer and graduated with honours from the University of Queensland. He is currently a principal process specialist at Wally Parsons, working primarily on hydrocarbons. He has had 30 years of experience in petrochemical plant operations and petrochemical and refinery technology and project development. He has worked in a wide range of management and senior management roles covering plant operations, engineering, RDNP, and also as a consultant. Today, Graham's part of the presentation will focus on project implementation and the technical lessons that, um, that we'll learn. So now I would like to hand over to Steve and Graham. Um, Graham will um, introduce the, the presentation and provide an outline of the presentation. Then Steve will talk more about the LNG sector and Graham will then um, talk more about the lessons learned. So Graham, welcome and please start your presentation. Thank you Dennis. Uh, as uh, Dennis mentioned, uh, we will uh, start our presentation today. We will start our presentation today uh, with Steve giving an explanation of the LNG industry and this will include a block flow diagram explanation of the LNG value chain. Uh, followed by the status of the LNG industry globally, including trade, the development history of liquefaction, and uh, some key projects. Uh, I'll then follow up with a quick status of the CCS value chain, and then move into uh, project implementation lessons, which include uh, capacity and growth effects, timeline, cost escalation, learning curve, and development history. Uh, look at technical lessons that can be drawn between LNG and CCS and the possibility of integration of uh, CCS with the LNG value chain. CCS is proposed to uh, make a major contribution to greenhouse gas reductions. In the IEA's lowest cost scenario, CCS is projected to reduce CO2 by 7 to 8 billion tonnes per year by 2050. And uh, starting from current uh, few tens of millions of tonnes per year, this is obviously a very significant growth rate. Uh, LNG is also an industry that has experienced significant growth over the last uh, few decades. And uh, so the Global CCS Institute uh, requested an analysis of the LNG development uh, to its current relatively mature state. Uh, and considering the full supply chain technology development, uh, efficiencies, costs, projects, contracting and so on uh, for uh, deriving lessons that can be applicable from LNG to CCS. So now over to Steve. Thank you, Graham. I have to start with a one-way moment. One way is Wally Parsons Enterprise-wide Integrity Management Framework which has an objective of achieving zero harm. And part of that process is to start all meetings with a one-way moment which can provide a valuable lesson or insight into hazards and risks and they are achieving our goal of zero harm. And the lesson I'd like to give is about rapid phase transition for LNG. And the pictures I'm going to show you are 
uh, extracted from a video that goes to France experiment and a guest to France experiment performed in the Bay of Biscay. And it's available on YouTube, the link's at the bottom of the screen. The experiment is uh, releasing LNG from the silver barrel in the middle of the picture onto the open sea. And there are these explosions occurring at regular intervals as the LNG rapidly vaporizes. And it's just the phase transition from liquid to vapor. It's not a combustion process. So uh, it's just rapid phase transition with very substantial uh, explosions indeed sufficient to damage infrastructure and lead to escalation of events. It depends on many factors, the composition of the LNG and the weathering off of the methane off that LNG, depends on the seabed temp seawater temperature and also uh, is affected by disturbance of the boundary layer, which can lead to a rapid the, uh, escalating uh, phase transition as the LNG becomes unstable. And so the lesson here is that the, there are events that aren't just associated with the hydrocarbons, but they're due to the very cold nature of the fluids that we're dealing with that lead to hazards. Turning to LNG and the value chain, uh, the chain is all the story of a natural gas value chain with the addition of gas transport being achieved by liquefaction, shipping and then regasification. And it's all about connecting the gas fields, the gas resource, to gas markets in an efficient way. Our main elements are the gas fields, gas processing facilities, LNG liquefaction, storage, transportation, more storage at the receiving end, and then regasification. And with this method, LNG can be transferred over great distances, literally halfway around the world, to connect the resource with the market. The key is liquefaction of the LNG by cooling to minus 160 Celsius. And by doing this, we can increase the density of the natural gas by a factor of 600, which makes ship transportation practical. It's a long established process which actually ultimately relies on the knowledge learned from liquefaction of air many, um, well, more than 100 years ago. And at present, around about 4,000 cargoes are shipped each year of LNG. It relies on proven technologies and there are a number of uh, suppliers of that technology which all come out with comparable thermal efficiencies and cost benchmarks and it would be regarded today as a conventional unit operation. Its uh, application is being extended into novel applications to commercialise unconventional gas resources which include calcium gas and shale gas but ultimately the LNG technology is the same in all the gas resources. A block flow diagram for the chemical engineers and us. The LNG process is like a conventional natural gas uh, process, process system, except for a small number of unique elements, which are, I've shown in blue here. The unique elements are LNG liquefaction, so uh, running the, the, LNG, the natural gas down to minus 160 degrees Celsius, where it can become a liquid. The associated refrigeration system, the LNG storage, and the regasification facilities. These units are quite conventional and the greatest variation lies not in the blue units but in the upstream uh, gas production system and gas conditioning systems which varies considerably depending on the sources of the gas. Some of the biggest cost elements are associated with the storage, transportation and regasification in these Pictures are just designed to give uh, a, a sense of scale, with Woodside's Pluto development on the right being a storage and shipping process, and the regasification terminal in Japan on the left. Turning to the story on LNG and its role in the world market, LNG represents more than 30% of global natural gas movements the rest being by pipeline. And gas, on a natural gas, represents more than 20% of the global primary energy demand. 
both LNG and natural gas are can forecast to continue recent growth trends. The growth is shown of demand and is shown on that top right scale and uh, showing an ongoing trend as expected. And the current planned developments shown in the green wedge are expected to be absorbed by the increasing demand. Further developments will be required to offset both the decline in older LNG facilities and further growth in demand. This map shows the global LNG trade as it currently stands in 2012 and there are five primary markets. There is Europe, North America, South America, India and North Asia. LNG started out as a Europe story with gas being exported from North Africa into Europe. The energy shocks of the 1970s fundamentally changed the markets and the shock to Japan in particular led to a desire for alternative sources of energy which were initially met from Southeast Asia, from Malaysia, from Indonesia and from Brunei. In more recent times, there's been the growth of Qatar as a source of LNG as it sits here in the Middle East, supplying to both the European market and to the East, Eastern Asian markets. And it supplies more than 30% of the worldwide supply of LNG. The US, I'd like to point out, represents a very small part of the market, but only less than five years ago was seen as being a major source of LNG import uh, demand until the advent of the shale gas revolution which has completely changed the energy balance. LNG developments primarily, predominantly occurred in waves and the waves have had different characteristics. Very much the initial developments were led by the national oil companies and governments uh, tied predominantly to nation building projects and required sovereign backing from both the exporters and the importers. So initially there was requirements to develop the LNG export infrastructure but they also had to develop the LNG import infrastructure as well. And as a result the initial developments were one-to-one -one trades between the export and the import infrastructure. Those investments in infrastructure required long-term baseload contracts of at least 20 years. Once that infrastructure had been developed and there were multiple sources of LNG available in the market, the market has matured and evolved to include more short-term and spot contracts. And we can see that there are now uh, as of the end of uh, late last year, there were 35 in different sites and 94 LNG trains capable of producing LNG and an additional 26 trains committed or under construction. That expansion program represents more than 30% capacity increase. LNG this, this plot shows LNG demand in million tonnes per annum over the time from the 1960s through to uh, last year. The nature of the development has been bursts of development, first following an oil, the oil crisis in the 1970s when energy prices rapidly shot up. There was a five year lag between that shock and the first LNG exports occurring. Then the Iran-Iraq war leading to another surge of developments. And then a long period of steady growth which ties in with the uh, Asian growth story. The burst right at the end here ties to uh, events such as Fukushima nuclear disaster which led to the phase out of nuclear energy in Japan and requiring substitute energy supplies which are predominantly being picked up by LNG. 
those because of the evolving market maturity of the market, uh, those supply requirements to Japan have been able to be met from current capacity, and so they didn't have that five-year lead time. Very much the story in the early days was about national oil companies leading the charge with potentially, well, in certain circumstances with advice from, from the international oil companies. The 1980s and on have seen the international oil companies being much greater involved. Uh, companies such as Chevron, Shell, BP, British Gas, ConocoPhillips, etc. And they are now leading developments and the national oil companies are participating in the developments. And more interestingly, in the last few years, we've seen the arrival of small independents and second-tier companies, companies like Inpex, Santos, Origin, and Chenier, who are now able to, because of the maturity of the market, able to join into this story. A couple of key projects I want to just talk about to show where the industry is heading. I talked earlier about North America was expected to be a big LNG import facility, and a lot of LNG import terminals were built, particularly on the Gulf of Mexico and up the east coast of the United States. With the shale gas revolution, there's an excess of gas in the North American market, which has depressed gas prices, and the utilization of the LNG import terminals in the U.S. has fallen to practically nothing. The operators of those facilities are looking at ways to, to realize the value in their assets, and they're looking at turning those import facilities into export facilities for U.S. projects on the Gulf of Mexico and on the East Coast have been approved for export with Sabine Pass construction currently underway. An amazing turnaround in the industry. Gorgon, on the right hand side, is notable for its sheer scale of development, uh, a 50 billion plus development and still growing according to the press and also notable for its use of large-scale CO2 sequestration. Final project I'd like to talk about is Prelude and Prelude F LNG, floating LNG. The LNG facility will be located at sea close to the resource. And Prelude will be the largest floating offshore facility in the world the photo on the bottom right shows the hull after its recent float out in Korea. And uh, the scale is enormous, 488 metres long by 74 metres wide. This technology has the potential to change the industry by making uh, LNG liquefaction even more of a commodity, a standard design applied on a repeatable basis built in a shipyard and then deployed to site. And Prelude is the start. There are, Woodside has already announced its plans for deploying a further three at Browse, off the northwest shelf of Australia. So an interesting trend. Um, so that concludes the background on the LNG. I'm now going to hand over to Graham to talk about the learnings that are applicable to CCS. Thank you, Steve. Okay, firstly we'll just start off with a quick recap of the CCS uh, uh, status and this should be familiar to uh, most uh, uh, participants who are familiar with CCS. The first three blocks in the diagram uh, on your screens are the existing widespread energy and resources industries uh, blocks that uh, um, convert energy and until now have mainly emitted uh, the resultant CO2 to the atmosphere. The proposed completion of the CCS value chain, uh, which until now has only been implemented in fairly small volumes, is to capture the CO2 from these industries, process and transport the CO2, and then inject it into suitable reservoirs. Uh, looking at capture for a moment, uh, capture technologies are typically classified into pre-combustion, uh, which is uh, often conducted at uh, an elevated pressure, by contact with solvents, post-combustion, which is typically uh, at around atmospheric pressure, and oxy-fuel, which combusts in an oxygen-rich mixture rather than air. 
just looking at the status of the large scale integrated projects uh, based on uh, the um, global status uh, reported by the uh, Global CCS Institute, uh, the large scale projects in execution and operation are dominated by industrial processing, and uh, that's capture from natural gas and synthesis gas. And the reason for this is that these are processes that already have a requirement to remove CO2. Uh, for natural gas, uh, CO2 needs to be removed to meet pipeline specifications or to prepare feed for LNG. In synthesis gas, the CO2 needs to be removed from shifted syngas uh, to meet the downstream requirements for ammonia or hydrogen production. And usually the captured CO2 is vented to atmosphere from regeneration. Sometimes the CO2 is incorporated into chemicals production, such as urea. Um, and for these sort of processes, the incremental cost to condition and compress the CO2 uh, released from the process is comparatively lower than the full cost of uh, post-combustion capture. Uh, and this is one of the contributors to uh, the industrial processes dominating. Uh, however, the total capture potential from these processes is uh, smaller than from other energy generation. Uh, looking quickly at the storage status, the, uh, the volume of CCS by storage type is dominated by the option that provides a value add for the CO2 stream that has been captured, and that's EOR. However, EOR also has a smaller ultimate uh, potential storage volume than other storage types. And uh, one of the main uh, larger volume potentials is deep saline formations. Uh, and there's a fair number of projects in development uh, reported by the Global CCS Institute. Uh, but those projects are dominated by CO2 that is sourced from gas processing, in which the incremental CCS cost has been justified by uh, national emissions pricing or by project licensing conditions. Uh, so just uh, looking at the status and volume of projects of CCS, um, the current uh, amount of stored CCO, CO2 amounts to about 25 million tonnes a year, uh, with further large-scale projects in development and execution totaling about 13 million tonnes a year. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the um, IEA lowest cost scenarios uh, are going to be about 7 billion tonnes a year by 2050, and that uh, includes interim targets of 50 million tonnes a year by 2020 and 2 billion tonnes a year by 2030. So with the significant growth rate that's required in CCS and uh, comparing it to the LNG growth curves that Steve presented earlier, uh, it could be um, interpreted that CCS is uh, at a comparable stage of maturity to what LNG was back in the 1960s to 70s. So swapping over now to project implementation lessons, um, Steve mentioned earlier that uh, the early LNG projects were single train and in a similar manner uh, CCS early projects will need to install the whole value supply chain uh, at once. So they will have to uh, install all facilities from capture through to storage. Um, in contrast to CCS, LNG has a clear demand driven commercial driver. Uh, for CCS, apart from enhanced oil recovery, uh, there is a lack of an adequate and predictable uh, greenhouse gas mitigation price, which means that there's uh, no commercial basis to justify up uptake. Uh, the current CCS commercial basis is dominated by enhanced oil recovery and with capture from gas processing, uh, but these sources and sinks have limited volume potential. Uh, LNG projects are bankable, with no commercial basis for CCS, finance is difficult to justify. Steve mentioned earlier that uh, the early LNG projects were uh, led by governments and their uh, respective national oil companies. Uh, and for CCS now, uh, government intervention is also required to at least set policy that supports a predictable CCS market. Um, in the LNG projects, as Steve mentioned early, even in the current state of maturity and with the participation of some of the largest corporations in the world, 
LNG project investments are typically shared uh, among IOCs and NOCs for uh, the um, liquefaction projects. And uh, we in interpret for CCS that uh, there will also need to be um, uh, investment cost load spreading amongst uh, stakeholders in the, uh, the full CCS uh, uh, value chain. Having a look at the capacity and project growth requirements uh, for the, the two industries, uh, although individual CCS projects are not as costly as LNG projects, so we, um, from the limited uh, data available on, on uh, actual CCS projects, it's a few billion dollars uh, for a project versus tens of billions of dollars for an LNG project. But the total global target capacity for CCS is far greater than for LNG, and the number of required projects is also far greater. So looking at LNG, uh, on the top left uh, graph, we've got the uh, historical uh, uh, liquefaction capacity in millions of tons per year, uh, both uh, historical up to current and then projected uh, for increases to 2020 and uh, 2030. And at the bottom left, we've got the uh, number of LNG trains, uh, both actual or currently underway in the red coloring, and uh, anticipated numbers required to meet the anticipated growth rate of L LNG in the, the blue bars. And you can see that we're talking sing single digit uh, numbers of trains per year required to meet the capacity targets. By comparison, on the right-hand side, uh, firstly, the CCS capacity uh, is growing, ex will have to grow exponentially. We've uh, plotted the capacity logarithmically. Uh, and then for the number of projects that need to be executed, if we assume that uh, uh, CCS projects have about 4 million tons per year per train capacity, uh, then we will need somewhere around uh, 50 projects per year between 2020 to 2030, and somewhere in excess of 60 projects per year from 2030 to 2050 in order to meet the growth targets. And uh, putting the industry development timeline for LNG and CCS on a consistent time basis, and this is uh, similar to the growth curves that Steve presented earlier, uh, what I'd like to highlight on the LNG um, growth, which is uh, above the line, is that since about the um, mid-1990s, uh, sorry, mid-1980s, we've had a doubling of demand in LNG approximately every decade. And that's to the current time, and then the next doubling is predicted between now and 2030. Uh, by comparison, under the uh, line on the CCS portion of the, um, the, the timeline, CCS will need to double capacity between now and 2020, and then it will need 40 times growth between 2020 to 2030, and then a further three and a half times capacity growth between 2030 to 2050. And it's hard to think of any uh, complex process industry that has had such uh, unprecedented um, growth rates. Um, for LNG, uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, news about the escalation of LNG projects, and, and uh, they've certainly experienced a lot of uh, capex es escalation over the last decade, approximately doubling uh, in unit cost. And CCS could be susceptible to similar risks. The graph on this uh, page is the um, uh, is sourced from IHS Sarah. The, it's the upstream capital cost index, uh, and it's a basket of uh, uh, upstream projects, which includes LNG. And uh, you can see that from approximately 2005 until currently, there's uh, more than a doubling of the, uh, the cost index. The causes of the escalation are non-technology related, they're project related, uh, and such causes as contractor capacity limits, high raw materials uh, prices due to high demand, uh, skilled construction workforce limits, currency exchange rates, and remote project locations. So excluding those project uh, technology cost contributors, what has technology been doing? 
what we've observed is that uh, over time uh, there has been sorting out of technology providers into, a, uh, into winning technologies that become the preferred industry standards. And uh, there are a couple of main technologies, uh, propane mixed refrigerant and optimized cascade that uh, lead the, the industry in number of, numbers of trains. Uh, the capacity of an individual LNG train has increased with technology improvement and that is promoted by project activity. So if you look at the uh, left-hand graph, uh, we've got each of the trains being uh, implemented uh, over time. And you can see we start out with uh, relatively low capacities of about a million tonnes per year per train in the 1970s. Um, and some growth and then a stabilisation at a two to three million with relatively few projects. And then as the number of projects increases, the technology improves and the capacity per train has significantly increased uh, since about uh, uh, 2000 and uh, now the industry norm is between four to five million tons per year with some examples up to eight million tons per year per train. For LNG the train capacity limits are compressors and heat exchangers. Um, the unit costs uh, have decreased with increasing train capacity and that is demonstrated by the graph on the right. Uh, there are many multi-train uh, developments uh, that are done to achieve an overall plant capacity and to phase project implementation. And for those you can see that once you increase the single train capacity limits then your unit costs uh, uh, over the entire plant uh, tend to flatten out. A couple of other technology observations for CCS relative to LNG is that there is a much greater energy penalty for CCS than LNG. Typically about uh, five to, uh, sorry, about seven to ten percent of the input energy to an LNG plant is consumed in producing the LNG and the remaining ninety to ninety three percent of the energy content is shipped out with the LNG product. Uh, by comparison, CCS uh, could consume anywhere from twenty to forty percent depending on the implementation. Um, there, uh, currently there is uh, a much greater technology selection variability and risk for CCS than for LNG. Uh, LNG has settled down to a comparatively mature technology market uh, with licensors and contractors competent to deliver projects and guarantee uh, technologies and contracting outcomes. Project development in LNG takes a long time. Uh, once projects are committed, uh, there's a relatively uh, predictable uh, schedule for their implementation and typically it will take somewhere in the order of uh, uh, four years uh, from uh, commencement of feed to uh, uh, start up of the plants. Uh, however, the time frame prior to commitment can vary significantly depending on how difficult the project is to implement. And these are not related, uh, the difficulties are not related to LNG technology, they are related to the upstream uh, uh, concept developments or complicated environmental and community stakeholder expectations that are associated with the projects. Some technical lessons uh, to be drawn between LNG and CCS. Uh, there is a difference uh, between LNG and CCS in terms of uh, how projects are located, uh, site selection. Uh, for LNG, the reservoir, uh, which is the source is of the, um, the, the project, is fixed. And site selection refers to uh, the location of the LNG process plant that needs to bring together proximity to the reservoir as well as a suitable uh, land environment for the process plant and marine access for the export facilities. Uh, by comparison for a CCS uh, project, the capture plant is fixed uh, and the site selection refers to the uh, location of the injection reservoir. Um, LNG plant layouts are driven by managing the hazard risks of the, um, the flammable materials that are being processed. Uh, for CCS, um, the plant layouts uh, will tend to be driven by integrating the capture plant with the source of the CO2. 
Uh, CCS hazards are very different than LNG. However, some of the containment and dispersion strategies that have been uh, developed and applied in the gas industry uh, could also be applicable to um, CCS. And finally, modularization is a concept that has been applied uh, to LNG construction, not universally, uh, but it does have advantages in um, certain project uh, uh, scenarios. And um, there will be, it may also be applicable to CCS, but there are definitely going to be contrasts between LNG and CCS related to uh, marine access and module transport uh, to site and greenfield construction versus brownfield integration aspects between LNG and CCS. Um, both LNG and CCS uh, have acid gas removal units uh, in their uh, scope. Uh, however, the LNG acid gas removal units are fairly uh, similar to pre-combustion capture, post-combustion being quite a different environment. Compression selection may be broadly similar between LNG uh, refrigeration compressors and CCS compression. Uh, the driver selection is going to be, be site specific for LNG, it tends to be gas turbines. Uh, utilities and infrastructure provision will be uh, different as well for LNG. Utilities and infrastructure tend to be delivered with the Greenfield Foundation project. Uh, for CCS, uh, those will require integration with the host facility. Um, looking very briefly at the integration of LNG, uh, of CCS with LNG, um, we've already mentioned the removal of CO2 from the LNG feed gas. Uh, the remaining uh, CO2 that could be captured from LNG facilities is the flue gas from gas turbine drivers uh, that uh, power the main refrigeration compressors. Wally Parsons has been involved in studies on the uh, the, the feasible options for um, CO2 capture from flue gas uh, and um, the preferred uh, implementation is post-combustion capture. However, the CO2 concentration is relatively low due to gas firing. So to summarize, uh, from the LNG experience, our expectations for CCS are that early projects are going to have disadvantages of smaller scale, uh, being one-to-one -one supply chains, needing to set up the entire supply chain in single projects to get the industry off the ground, whereas later projects will have the advantage of that existing infrastructure having been established. There will be a more diverse supply chain, more mature technology, and uh, learning curve reductions should have been implemented. Uh, one of the potential downsides that can strike at any time is project cost escalation due to market constraints. and. Uh, CCS deployment in order to achieve the greenhouse gas targets is going to require very high project activity. At the same time, LNG and other process industries are also going to expect high activity. So there is the risk of market constraints both within the CCS industry and across industries that utilize uh, similar um, engineering and construction resources. Uh, in, in LNG, we saw that uh, governments led the early development of the industry and intervention is required to establish such significant industries. Uh, and, at, and for CCS, at a minimum, governments must set policies to support adequate and predictable pricing for greenhouse gas mitigation in order to provide a commercial basis for CCS. Uh, LNG is quite strong in that regard. Uh, LNG is, uh, is an energy stream that can substitute into uh, the overall energy uh, uh, mix of a uh, country or an economy, uh, whereas for CCS only uh, enhanced oil recovery has large scale positive value for CO2 and that's not sufficient to underpin the required greenhouse gas targets. So uh, as, as Sue said before, the, uh, uh, some of the government intervention is needed to re uh, set the commercial basis that justifies a greater greenhouse gas reduction into uh, non-enhanced oil recovery destinations. Uh, that concludes our presentation and uh, now I'd like to hand back to Dennis. Um, thank you, Graham and Steve. Um, thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, 
So it seems like you've, you have um, identified and summarised quite a number of lessons from the LNG sector and how they're applicable to, um, to carbon capture and storage. So that's great. Um, we've received a few um, questions from our, um, from our audience. Um, one of the first questions is about the report, and I can answer that question. Um, the, there is a technical report um, associated with this webinar, and that's available from the Global CCS Institute website. Um, that was uploaded just, um, just prior to Christmas. Uh, so if you'd like to go and look on the website and download the report, it has more detailed information um, that supports this, this webinar. Um, Steve, we have a, a, um, a few questions. Um, one of the first questions, which, which I'd like to, to talk to you about, uh, was um, when you talked about the limits, um, you mentioned that there was limitations to the LNG project size, and that that was due to the physical size of equipment, for example, the compressors. Um, do, you, do you have any views on whether there are similar limitations for CCS project sizes? I'm going to let Graham answer that one. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, there, there will be uh, similar limitations uh, for post-combustion capture, in particular. Uh, I believe that the um, uh, the scrubber uh, is going to be uh, potentially limiting, and that uh, uh, some of the projects which are being considered at the moment uh, have a limited about uh, 25 metres uh, diameter uh, for the scrubber, which I believe corresponds roughly to about 4 million tonnes per year uh, capacity. Um, I'm sure that there will be novel ways of uh, uh, getting around capacity limitations, uh, just as the LNG industry has uh, observed. As soon as uh, some projects start being implemented, uh, then people will look at uh, ways that either greater capacity can be obtained from given equipment dimensions, or the dimensions increased, or key equipment uh, placed in parallel in order to uh, uh, get around uh, those capacity limits. And then, uh, eventually, oh, well, uh, even within those capacity constraints, uh, to get the overall capacity target that you need from a given site, um, as we've seen in LNG, uh, you can get multiple trains being installed in parallel and being phased in implementation, uh, so that for a given train capacity limit, you can still achieve a greater overall plant capacity. Okay, thanks for that. Um, a, a question that came out that just rose up from that one um, was just some clarification about the compressors. Um, what are the, the differences between the compressors for LNG and for CCS? Why don't you say what the, the LNG compressors are, and I'll follow with what we know about the CCS compressors. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the LNG compressors are refrigerant compressors, and they're large centrifugal units with very large turbine drives, the largest turbine drives around being GE's frame 9, um, drivers and what else is there to say? They're gas turbine directly linked to the compressors, and uh, this basically that's the largest that the industry has developed to date. It, it drives the whole process. There are some electric motors linked to them to help start them. They're so large, and basically a big electric starter motors. Yeah. Okay. And for CCS, uh, well, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, the LNG compressors are multi-stage compressors in order to achieve the uh, compression ratios, uh, the overall compression ratios that uh, uh, you need to achieve. Um, what's the typical number of stages for an LNG compressor, LNG refrigeration compressor? Oh, probably about five to six per, per impellers per stage, typically, I think. And then, but then, then there's the refrigerants. The, there's a, a thermodynamic efficiency gain by having multiple suction pressures for the refrigerants, which naturally breaks the compressors up into manageable sizes, particularly when they're constrained on the discharge temperatures from the compressor drives. The, the maximum number of thermodynamic stages you can put in. Yeah. Uh, okay. So by comparison, uh, we we seem to have roughly the same number of uh, five to six uh, stages of compression uh, from 
uh, a low pressure source such as uh, a post combustion capture uh, into a typical uh, um, CCS uh, um, transport uh, pipeline. Uh, I believe that the uh, uh, typical uh, uh, compressor installation that is being uh, considered for CCS is uh, all gear type uh, uh, integral compressors. Um, but uh, overall, uh, in terms of the, the overall compression ratios and the number of stages, uh, they're fairly similar. Different compressor configurations, though. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I've got a, a quick question about uh, methanol. Um, methanol well, can be used for um, a liquid fuel or for a, a, a feedstock. Um, do you know um, the... Um, just how does the um, the methanol production how's that increased with LNG production is there a link with that or, or not methanol sorry production yeah methanol There's production no... from from natural gas has that grown with LNG production or has that remained fairly, fairly oh, constant see. over time yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, um, I with, this is not a topic that the uh, that this report uh, analysed specifically. Um, uh, I think typically uh, the the methanol producers, when they're siting a plant, try to uh, put the methanol back as close as possible to the source uh, because they're going to obtain uh, more economical feedstock that way. And typically what you'll do is you'll have uh, the, uh, the owners of a resource of, of natural gas uh, looking at uh, parallel pathways for adding value to that gas. So LNG is one pathway that you can uh, implement that will enable that gas to move to an energy demand market. And Steve illustrated all of that earlier. Typically what you'll have in parallel uh, being considered for the same resource is to uh, co-locate or alternatively locate there a methanol plant and uh, so you have uh, plants such as the, um, you know, the, the Methanex plant that used to be at uh, Mont Nui in uh, New Zealand and uh, the Chilean methanol plants and so on. Those are located close to the resource and then you can move the methanol as being a, uh, a transportable um, uh, chemical product or uh, or, or energy carrier in a similar way that LNG is a carrier. Uh, I haven't heard so many cases where you would put methanol downstream of an LNG plant and move LNG to a methanol plant. Okay, thank you. Um, just in your view, do you think there's a, um, um, a greater, um, greater potential for carbon capture and utilisation than for carbon capture and storage? And how do you see both of those sectors developing or complementing each other? Uh, okay, there's a lot of um, utilization technologies that are being developed um, and I'd say the ones that have got a reasonable chance of being economical are where you get uh, carbon capture uh, displacing on purpose CO2 uh, generation to fit into a, uh, a chemical a stream or a uh, uh, or some other value adding stream. So, for example, I mentioned before that uh, CO2 is incorporated um, into urea uh, in an ammonia plant. Now, all of that CO2 is obtained from within the ammonia, uh, the synthesis gas cleanup uh, going into the ammonia cycle. Other CO2 uh, chemical processing, uh, chemical process utilizations include, uh, for example. Um, uh, sodium bicarbonate uh, and, uh, and soda ash production. However, if you do the, uh, the maths and figure out how much CO2 can you absorb into those markets um, within the current uh, utilization of, of bicarb and soda ash around the world, it's a comparatively small fraction of uh, um, global uh, CO2 energy emissions. Um, I think most of the other value-adding type uh, utilizations like that are going to be a similar sort of story. There's going to have to be a new technology that comes along that 
can really absorb uh, tremendous volumes of CO2 uh, for that to make a, um, a meaningful contribution to uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions that, that, um, that look at the, um, that ask about um, synergies between LNG and CCS. And some of them are about uh, whether you see um, the deep shale um, gas sources that are, that are currently being exploited in the US. Whether you, what are your views on whether those reservoirs will be able to be used as um, storage sites in the future? <laughs> Thank you, Graham. <laughs> I, I don't particularly see a market for storage in those facilities. I know they become a storage uh, location. The, the whole nature of those shale gas resources is that they're extremely low productivity and they require a huge number of wells. And you, if they were fully depleted, would they potentially provide a, a storage site? But there's no significant benefit to be gained by storing the CO2 in there. And it will be such low productivity that there will be an enormous number of wells and distribution required. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, where do you anticipate the workforce will come from for um, the growth in LNG? And also, um, how will that complement or compete with the workforce requirements for carbon capture and storage? Well, I think there's not a specific workforce for LNG. All the, the hydrocarbons and, uh, in, and processing industries basically share the same construction workforce, and ultimately they often share the same suppliers as well. And uh, ultimately, it's an economic decision based on, you know, if you're seeing large demand, we, we saw large demand in the iron ore industry at the same time as we saw large demand in the LNG industry here in Australia. And basically, at the end of the day, it was uh, who, who blinked first on them being able to afford the cost escalation. Right. Yeah. So, and we've, we've seen, seen similar uh, uh, capacity uh, related cost escalations uh, due to uh, resource constraints uh, in other industries. So, for example, uh, when the refining clean, clean fuels projects uh, were being implemented uh, as a wave through um, uh, the uh, OECD economies, uh, a lot of the resources that were associated with those projects um, uh, were overstretched, and that was also at about the same time uh, in some economies that we were seeing uh, the escalation in the um, LNG projects. As Steve said, uh, it's all similar engineering, procurement, construction uh, uh, resources that get applied across those industries. Okay. Actually, that leads in very nicely to, um, to the, the last question. Um, you, had, you showed a chart about um, the cost escalation of projects, and you also talked about um, the cost reductions of, of LNG technology. Um, what are your views on how the cost escalations that you showed for the LNG sector, how will that impact on CCS? Will that be the same level? And um, conversely, will the, the cost reductions, will, will, will we be able to achieve the same type of cost reductions as what we've seen in LNG? Okay, on the cost escalations, uh, I think the answer is yes, CCS will be subject to fairly similar cost escalation. Uh, if you go to the, the, um, uh, the IHS SARA website, which uh, we have um, um, included that reference in the report, they also present uh, escalation curves for the downstream hydrocarbon industry and also the power industry. And you can see that all of those industries are escalating in about the same time frame by roughly the s similar amounts. So uh, I think that all of those are linked. And regardless of whether you think CCS is a chemical process or a power process, uh, it's still going to be competing for a similar pool of resources. Now, in terms of the technology learning curve uh, improvements, as we saw on the LNG industry, you really only get significant rate of improvement in unit cost when you are implementing projects that allow you to improve the technology and fold that back into projects. So until there's significant 
a significant amount of project activity underway in CCS, it's difficult to predict the, um, that there will be a learning curve cost reduction. Once it's underway, then it should be, um, it, it should be evident. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's all the time we have um, for questions. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for um, posing those fantastic questions. And I understand there's a few questions which we didn't, didn't get through, but we will try and get back to, uh, to individual um, people with, with answers to the questions in the next week or so. Um, if you'd like to provide feedback on this webinar or suggest topics for future webinars, please contact us at the Global CCS Institute with um, our email addresses here. Um, so thank you all for your attendance. A rem reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our, next, uh, on our website in the next few days. The report uh, from Wally Parcels is also available on our website and the link is shown on your screen. Um, so that's where the, the, the report is. Um, I certainly hope that you found this webinar valuable. And once again, thank you to Steve Hensel and Graham Cox for presenting. Um, goodbye for now.